Hey there, Touch Designer developers, Jack Delora here with the Interactive and Immersive HQ. In this video, we're going to push things in a little bit of a different direction and uh, focus on the crossover between design and generative art a little bit uh, by creating this generative poster, which is directly inspired by the work of John Maeda. So Maeda is an interesting kind of multidisciplinary artist designer. And uh, specifically for this piece, we are taking inspiration from this series of posters that he did in the the 90s for this Japanese company, Morisawa. So he's kind of an interesting character in that he's able to kind of work between these two disciplines. He's using computer code to play with type forms and uh, kind of bring something that maybe would have been seen in the world of art more commonly into this commercial context. So I thought it was a very cool piece and a great opportunity to kind of translate this, the visual concepts here and this aesthetic into touch designer. So we're going to start off with a blank network and begin with SOPs. So we're going to use uh, instancing for this particular effect, which will you know, enable us to create a bunch of copies of a texture without having to have a, a million operators to do so. Um, so again, let's head to the SOP page and uh, go ahead and grab a rectangle SOP. So the rectangle is going to be the initial piece of geometry, um, which will eventually be the, the kind of topmost um, texture, the one that is repeated in this particular uh, poster that we're going to be making. So we need to change the scale of this thing first of all before we can move on and get into our uh, rendering and all that fun stuff. So. The, uh, the size here is actually going to correspond to the actual number of pixels, which we're gonna do some stuff later, some magic to make that all work. But um, the size X is going to be 720, and the size Y is going to be 240. I'm going to hook up a null after that, and then I'm going to right click on the output of the null, and then head over to the comp page in this dialog and grab a geometry comp. So we've got our geometry and now we need to add some other stuff if we're going to then take this and render it to a texture. So first of all, I want a material and I'm going to use a simple good old constant material for this one. So go ahead and add that to the network. We're going to take the constant material and drag that right onto the geo comp, which will bring up this little dialogue here, uh, which we're then going to click parameter material. So those two things have had a connection made. And then we need to add a camera and a render top to actually render this to a texture. So we're gonna head back to the comp page and add a camera. And I'll put that over to the right. And then I will also go ahead and add a render top while we're at it. So the screen is uh, just white right now because we're, we're basically cropped in uh, to a very small portion of this texture. And we need to make some changes in our camera, first of all, to, uh, to be able to see the portion of this that we want to for this effect. So the camera we're going to set to orthographic mode, first of all, because we don't really need any three-dimensional perspective. This is just gonna be a flat poster design. So the first thing that we're gonna do is head to the view page here and turn the projection mode from, uh, change it from perspective to orthographic. That's just one step that we have to take uh, before or after that rather, we have to set this parameter here called ortho width, which is uh, basically going to define the kind of field of view that we're seeing out of our camera. And if we um, take this and basically synchronize it with the width of our render, it's going to uh, do some, some helpful things for us, which we're going to get into in a moment. So let's do that first of all. We're gonna set this ortho width based on the width of our render top. So I can do that by creating a, an expression. So I'm gonna type in op, open and close parentheses, single quotes, and then I want to point this to the render one top. And then I want the parameter of that render top uh, which we access by typing in dot par dot resolution w for width. 
that should bring a value in of 1280. And we then should see our rectangle now floating in the center of the screen. So now we can actually see the whole thing instead of just a very kind of cropped in portion of it. So that's good. Uh, but the uh, the resolution of our render is making this look a little bit less like a poster. Posters are usually kind of in a vertical format. Uh, and this obviously looks more like it's going to end up on a screen somewhere. So what we're going to do in the render is just come to the common page and basically flip our resolution values. So for the width, we're going to have a value of 720. And for the height, we'll have a value of 1280. That should basically change our little composition here so that the edges of our rectangle should be um, touching the edges of the render. And again, it should still be centered within this rendered space. So the magical connection that I was talking about a moment ago, uh, let's just jump back to that real quick. By setting, setting this uh, ortho width parameter to the width of the render, we're making essentially a one-to-one -one ratio between these units that we're scaling our rectangle at, which are kind of arbitrary, um, and the actual amount of pixels that the shape that they generate ends up being in the render. So by setting the ortho width this way, we know that by setting a rectangle to a size of 720 by 240, which again is this kind of abstract unit when we're in this, this 3D space, we know that it's then going to be a rectangle that is in fact 720 pixels wide by 240 pixels tall. So that's just a helpful way when you're trying to be very specific about the sizing and also the positioning of a particular piece of geometry. Um, so from there, I'm going to do one quick change in the geo comp before we kind of move on to adding a texture to this. And that is to shift this initial texture up to the top edge of the screen. So we, we want that to be like our initial, uh, you know, first, first iteration of the typographic forms. And then from there, they're going to kind of reduce in height until the bottom of the poster where they're very small and almost, uh, you know, like a straight line. So to do that, all we have to do is just come to the transform page here and shift our translate Y position to a value of 520 and hit enter. And that'll move that rectangle right up to the top edge of the screen. Now let's go ahead and add the, uh, the texture, which is a couple of different letter forms, which will be applied to this, this uh, rectangle. So I approach this via using text tops. Of course, you can play around with any top texture that you want. It doesn't have to be text or uh, you know any, anything typography related, um, but that's what we're gonna do for this example. So I'm gonna add a text top. I'm going to make some changes to that and then copy and paste it and then we'll add it as a texture. So first of all, within this text top, we're going to um, set the resolution. So I specifically set up this rectangle to be 720 pixels wide because it's easily divisible into three parts, each one being 240 pixels. So we can then set this resolution here to 240 by 240. And if we have three of these, these uh, squares next to each other, they will uh, fill in this entire space that that rectangle takes up. So that's kind of where we're going with this one. So we've set ourselves a resolution. Let's go ahead and change the font as well. Uh, this will kind of depend on you know your particular system and what you have installed. I am going to use one that comes with uh, Windows, I believe, called Franklin Gothic Medium. Uh, we'll click on that and then I'm going to set the font size here to 500. My goal here is to basically crop really close in on the uh, letter form. So it, it it's still like legible, but sort of abstracted and we pay more attention to the form and the pattern that it creates. But um, again, this is all kind of personal taste. So I've cropped in on that. I need to do a couple of other uh, simple positioning adjustments and then we'll make copies of this for the other pieces of text. So first of all, in our position parameter, I want this to um, 
shift up slightly in the y direction. So I'm gonna enter in zero and then 50 for the uh, y parameter. Again, that's just kind of shifted things a little bit. And then the other thing that I want to do for the horizontal alignment mode is to set that to use the text bounding box, which won't really do much right now, but will be important when we are using a single letter later on. Uh, that is it for this uh, particular text top. So I'm just gonna copy and paste it two more times. And then we can go back and I'm going to change these so that they're just containing a single letter instead of the uh, default derivative text. So I just chose the letters ABC because it's nice and simple. Feel free to do whatever you want here. Um, so I'm gonna head back to the text page and change the derivative text to read A for this first one. Um, we'll go to the second one, this will be B. And then for the third one here, that will be C. So from there, we want to take these textures and basically put them side by side one another so that they are going to fill in the entire space of this rectangle. The easiest way to do that is to use a handy layout top, which I'll put here, and we'll connect all three operators to that. Now you might have noticed that it has indeed put them side by side, but the resolution is 240 by 240, which is you know very small and not really useful for uh, correctly applying this to that, that piece of geometry. But if we turn on this scale resolution parameter, what it will do instead is, is calculate that output resolution by uh, you know stacking these things next to each other. So now it's going to be 720 by 240, which should look familiar as it is the resolution or the scale of the rectangle. So I can then add a null after this and this will be the texture that we're applying to the geometry. So I'm gonna call this um, null space texture, as you might imagine, just to kind of confirm that is what we're using it for. And I will then drag this right onto the constant, which should apply it as a texture to that geometry. So then if we look in the output here, we can see that lo and behold, there is that texture. So uh, we're going to do just one more thing before we kind of head into the, uh, the the next part of the network, which is where we generate instances using chops. I want to composite in a solid background behind the, the texture that we're generating or the, the rendered output here, because as you can see, we will have transparency because these letter forms um, you know, don't have a background by default. So. Um, I'll just do a little bit of cleanup by moving this a little bit closer and then what I'm going to do after the render is add a handy constant top which we're going to use again to composite in a background so I will leave everything the same on the constant page but head to the output page where I'll change the operation here to under which will uh, basically composite that white constant texture underneath the text. Unfortunately, because the text is white at this point, we can't really see anything. Um, it just looks like a blank white screen. But later on, when we add in some color, that will be handy to have already complete. I'll finally add uh, another null here, which we'll call like null final or null out or something, just to note that this is the end of our kind of post effects rendering section. And with that, we can continue on to um, instancing and actually creating copies of this geometry. So we're going to use a mathematical uh, function called exponentiation or an exponential function to generate the type of effect that we're looking for, which if we take a look at this example from Wikipedia, the, the basically the curve or the line that we're going to generate to, to create this look is going to look something like this downward sloping curve. So uh, if we go back to Maeda's poster, we can see that these uh, lines of type are slowly reducing in scale by something maybe around uh, in between 50 to 75% per step. I'd say it's probably closer to like 75. So they just keep uh, basically like reducing the scale by something like 75% as we go further and further down until we basically lose all uh, kind of semblance of this line of text. Super cool effect and using an exponential function should give us something that looks uh, similar to this kind of aesthetic. So 
how do we do that? Well, an easy way to approach this is to work with chops uh, because we have a number of useful uh, kind of utility chops that can that can generate things like this for us. So uh, the way that we're going to approach it today is by starting off with a pattern chop, which we're going to use basically uh, almost like to assign a, a an X value to each one of the instances that we're generating. So again, if it doesn't make sense now, uh, hopefully it will make a little bit more sense in a moment. But uh, what we're going to do with this pattern chop is to set the type here from sign to ramp samples, which will give us a nice ramp, uh, which then is also ranged between zero and the total number of samples that we're generating automatically without having to do anything else to it. So that's pretty useful. Um, from there, we're going to take this and uh, use it as a part of that exponential function that I was just talking about. So we can take that data and connect it to a function chop, which is a very useful one. And then we can click on the function drop down here and pick down here, we have one uh, power of x, which is, uh, we want the one here that says base to the power of input one. So this lets us set a particular constant value and then um, raise it to the power of the current sample in our, um, our input data. And if we change this base value to something else, we can uh, then generate the downward sloping curve that we saw in that Wikipedia article. So if I set this to something like um, 0 0.8135, which I have uh, specifically calculated for this effect, using a different one will not give you the same results, just so you're aware. Basically what this is doing is for each successive value that we have in this chart, we are uh, generating 81.35% of the previous value. So it's like slowly scaling this, uh, the value down over time and will give us that cool, uh, that cool effect that we saw at the beginning. So cool, we have this data. Uh, let's go ahead and add a null so that we kind of bookend this part of the network. Since the function is called POW, I'm gonna call this POW, null POW as well. And then we can focus on the first part of our instancing uh, little sub network, which is uh, going to define the positions of each one of the instances. So to do that, we need to use a math chop and uh, connect this null to the math chop. I'm gonna kind of move this over the right because we're gonna have a couple branches off of this, uh, this particular node. So in the math chop, we need to change the range here because uh, basically positioning our, our instances from a range of one to zero means that they will literally just be positioned from pixel one to pixel zero because of all that uniform stuff that we, uh, uniform ratio stuff that we set up with the camera. So we need this range to be much bigger than zero to one basically is what I'm getting at. So let's go to the range page here. And first of all, we're gonna set the from range to be falling between one and zero instead of zero to one, because as you can see, the kind of initial point starts at one and then it gets lower until it almost hits zero after that. In the two range, we actually do want it to start at zero and then we want it to decrease into the negative values from there. The reason for that is that we have shifted basically the zero zero point where this, this piece of geometry is located in our render to the top. And so that means to make anything fall below this, this piece of geometry, we have to move it in the negative direction in the Y axis. So that's, that's kind of the, the gist of what, or the reasoning why we are doing this particular rearranging. So, for the two range, the second value here, I'm gonna set that to a value of negative 1160, which again, I have pulled from our render, um, basically had to come up with this value based on the amount of space that this initial piece of geometry takes up, and then we wanna fill up the rest of this render. So that's um, how much that ended up taking up. So uh, from there, we can simply add a rename chop to change the name of this channel to something a little bit more uh, 
a little bit more useful and um, informative. This is going to be adjusting the Y position of the instance. So I'm going to call it Y capital P O S for Y position. And then I'm going to add a null to the end. And I'm going to call this null space INST space. Well, I guess we can do camelback notation here. So INST capital P O S for instance position. And then we can go ahead and go into the geo here and head to the instance page, turn instancing on, and then drag null uh, instance position into the translate op parameter. And then for translate Y, we want the Y position channel. So we can see already we've got something interesting going on here. This actually looks pretty cool as it is. Um, what you might have noticed compared to the initial version is that uh, because we're just shifting the position of these instances, we have um, a texture that is staying the same size as we go down. So what it what it is generating instead is a, a sort of cropped version of the texture, which is honestly a pretty cool effect on its own and probably something worth exploring if you are interested in uh, you know that kind of vibe. But uh, besides that, we're going to continue on and, and add in the scaling as well. So the way that we're going to do that is by, first of all, adding a pattern chop once again. Now, you might remember if we flip back to the um, browser for a moment here, wherever that is. There we go. Uh, the texture, this, this line of text here, uh, actually rotates 180 degrees each uh, subsequent step that we are kind of increasing down this um, column of, of text. So we are both going to scale the, the height of this and rotate the texture at the same time. So the pattern we're going to use to create that kind of flip-flop effect with the texture. First of all, we need to ensure that this has the same length as our pattern one chop from before. So I'm going to set the length parameter here. Uh, we're going to use a chop or a, uh, an expression to grab the length parameter of pattern one. So I'm going to click on the title and in this dropdown type in OP, open and close parentheses, single quotes. And then I want to grab pattern one and then I want to access the parameter, so dot par dot length. And that should give us a value of 1000. The next thing that I want to do is set the number of cycles here to be half that of the length parameter. So um, we'll talk about why we're doing this in just a moment, but let's go ahead and do that first. So I'm going to click on the title here again. And then I'm going to type an expression for this. So if I type in me.par.length, that will access the parameter of this particular operator called length. And we want to, as I was saying, divide that by two. So I'm going to add that to the expression as well, which should give us a value of 500. Now it looks like nothing has uh, happened or, or our output looks, uh, you know, like nothing is happening. That's because we're not actually using the correct type of pattern at the moment. So we don't actually want a sine wave in this example. We want to use the square wave instead. And you can see now that we have a bunch of uh, different samples being generated at different values. And if we zoom way in, what we can see is that for every subsequent sample in this channel, we are oscillating between negative one and positive one, which will allow us basically to flip this texture 180 degrees or upside down, whichever you prefer and um, get that kind of effect that we're looking for. So that is what we're doing with this particular operator. Now we can actually take the output of the function from before and multiply it by this pattern to give ourselves the scale parameter for the Y channel uh, of our instances. So I'm going to add a math chop for that and I'm going to connect the output of the function first and then the pattern to the second input. And then I'm going to hit uh, the combine chops parameter here and, and select multiply, which then it's subtle, but actually has changed the output. Uh, we can see at this bottom portion here, we now have some of our values going in the uh, negative one direction as well. Like before, I'm going to add a rename 
chop to, oops, not that one, but the rename, to rename the channel. I'm gonna follow the kind of uh, naming convention there and call it Y scale and hit enter. And then I will add a null to the end and we'll call this one um, null scale. So here we can then go back to the geo and drag in null scale into the scale op and then grab the Y channel for the scale Y parameter. If we then take a look at the output, you can see that we have the exact same texture that we saw at the beginning of the video. So we uh, have kind of completed the main like compositional component of it, but there is actually still more that we can do to uh, continue with this effect and we will do that now. So although uh, Maeda's uh, poster series is all black and white, I thought that because we're working with instancing, we have all this data, it could be a great opportunity to use that data to also apply colors to these instances. And so we're going to walk through how to do that now. Let's start off with a noise chop. We're going to use this to generate random um, RGB colors for the, um, the, the instances. And we're going to make a couple of changes to this operator. Uh, first of all, we want to set the, um, the channel names and the length of the channels that we're getting out of this so that they match, again, the number of instances that we're defining with pattern one. So first of all, I'm going to change the channel names here to read R space G space B so that we have three channels, um, again, with those titles, and they all have different random values in them. Then I'm going to go to the end parameter here. I'm going to set the uh, units here to uh, samples. And then I'm going to type in an expression to again grab the length from pattern one. So I'm going to click on the end drop down. And then in the first uh, box here, I'm going to type in op, open and close parentheses, single quotes. And then I want pattern one. And then I want dot par dot length. The only thing that we need to do besides that here is to actually subtract one because this is a zero index based uh, parameter. So it should read 999 once you've got that entered in correctly. And what we should see if we middle mouse click on that operator is that we have a total of 1000 samples, which is here the 1000 I uh, component that we see. So that is perfect. Now we can actually use the lookup chop to uh, basically assign a different color value to each one of the instances within this, um, this, this chop channel of data. So first of all, if I connect that null to the first input, that is going to be our index parameter, which is basically going to define, you know, where we're going to look within this lookup table. And then we'll connect the noise to the second input, which will then generate um, RGB channels. Now, we're going to go back to the noise in a second to modify the, the parameters of the noise that it's outputting. Um, but before we do that, I just want to flip this index range here because we kind of start at a value of one and drop to a value of zero in this particular data. So I'm just going to flip the range on the index range parameter to follow suit. So let's go back to the noise for a moment. Uh, one other thing that I want to do, as I said, is kind of uh, smooth this out and, and give ourselves more of a subtle uh, gradient-like transition instead of this kind of choppy uh, uh, noise values, which will, will give us more of a random look for each one of our instances. So I'm gonna start off by setting the period to a value of 50 which again, immediately has smoothed things out significantly. And then the other thing that I need to do is the output range of this data currently is going from uh, positive one to negative one, even though for this particular part of the noise we're looking at, we, we don't really have that range. If we ever move the seed around or change the position within that noise simulation, we will end up with values that are basically outside of the color range in Touch Designer, which is uh, zero to one. So if I change the amplitude here to 0.5 and then I set the offset here to 0.5, those have now been uh, manipulated to fall between the zero to one range. Last thing I'm gonna do here is just set a seed value randomly. So 
feel free to just click around until you find something that you like. You can always come back later. This will define what specific colors are applied to the instances. And uh, with that, we can actually go ahead and actually apply this to the instances. So I'm gonna hit a, a Alt N after this, look up again to add a null. And this one I'm gonna call null space color. Then we can come into the geo again and head to the instance two page where at the bottom we have this color section. So I'm gonna drag the null color onto the color op and then I will bring in the RGB channels uh, that correspond with those colors. So if we then look in the background here, we can see that we've got this nice gradient being applied to these instances. And if we come to the noise again, we can move the seat around and generate all different kinds of cool gradients that uh, actually work pretty nicely as is. But you know, obviously like everything in touch, you can come in here and manipulate to your heart's content and end up with very different looks. Um, before we kind of close out, I did want to point out one thing, uh, which you may have noticed if you're working on this in your own machine. The bottom here looks very blurry. And if I zoom in on this texture, and we look at it, you can see that it, it is actually very blurry and fuzzy compared to up here where the lines are much sharper. This has to do with a particular uh, filtering setting of the texture and also because the um, instances that we have down here are being squashed smaller and smaller, that, that filtering is really coming into play. So if we want to kind of correct for this and give us something that is, um, is sharper like what we see at the top, we can head back to the constant one operator from before. And uh, we'll see this parameter called color map. We can click on this double arrow on the right to open up some additional options. And we'll see here that we have a filter setting. So if I turn that from MIP map linear to linear, what we'll see is then we end up with uh, that filtering being removed. And now things uh, don't look so great either in that they are now super pixelated instead of being super fuzzy. However, we still have another option for correcting that as well. We have like an anti-aliasing filter that uh, follows the filter setting. And if we turn that to like 16 times, you can see that that really smooths out all of those rough edges. And then we have uh, much sharper edges like those at the top. So that's just one of the ways that you can tweak how your texture is being applied to, you know, make the output of this particular effect look better. So uh, with that, that is, that is basically everything that we are uh, covering within the scope of this video, but hopefully this has been fun to put together. I hope that you really get a sense of the possibilities for using touch for things that maybe are not as, uh, as common uh, of applications for it, which I think design is one of those areas where it can be uh, particularly interesting. And uh, one of the things that I'd recommend trying right away is you can connect anything that you want to the texture and have this same sort of uh, scaling effect applied to it. So you don't need to be dealing with uh, specifically typography or anything like that. You can go into the world of abstract generative art uh, videos, whatever you want. Uh, this will, you know, obviously still function with any of that sort of thing. So there's a lot of room to play around there. Uh, you can definitely go further with the the instancing component and, and do even more with that as well. And I'd recommend also taking a look at the rest of that Maeda uh, poster series because you can also get some inspiration from those posters as well. So with that, we're going to wrap this one up. Hope you've enjoyed putting it together. Look forward to seeing you in the next video and thank you so much for watching. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.